Hello, big fellows. This is webinar number 11. And the title of webinar number 11 is Ventricular Assist Devices. It's presented by me, Richard Cornelissen. I'm working at Medtronic Wacken Research Center in Maastricht. And Philip Westphal is my PhD student. So you see my email here as well. So if there are any questions which you can come up with during the lecture, please let me know through this email and I'll make sure that I answer these questions. So like stated, it's about ventricular assist devices. I'm not going into great detail about the technical aspects of the ventricular assist devices, but I give you more a general in, uh, overview. So as you might have heard from previous webinars, end stage heart failure can result in patients being frequently in the hospital or having a very significant limited quality of life. And we hope by implanting a ventricular assist device that these patients will be able to enjoy a much improved quality of life and personal freedom. So in the severe heart failure, the heart muscle is extremely weakened and it's not able to pump blood to the rest of the body to deliver the oxygen. What a ventricular device does is after surgically implanted, it basically takes over the pumping function of the heart. And so the rest of the body can get the nutrients and oxygen that they need. So this is a general introduction and I will go more deeply into the heart failure, uh, heart failure status and for therapy. So as you might know, um, one in five patients have a lifetime risk of developing heart failure, and this is in the developed countries, and it's over 40 years of age. It's becoming a serious and growing problem because people are getting older. We have much more comorbidities like uh, lung problems, COPD, or diabetes, or other metabolic problems, and we see, have also an increasing number of survivors after a myocardial infarction. So when a patient is diagnosed with heart failure, the chances of dying nowadays um, is still 50%. And the other um, number I wanna give here is that patients who are diagnosed with heart failure for the first time, they will be readmitted to hospitals within 30 days. So next to the patients being you know, broad and great in number, also the economic burden is pretty high in uh, for society. This picture might have been displayed uh, with previous webinars, but I think it's an important one for people to realize that the heart failure is a has a progressive nature. So in this picture, we see on the y-axis, low to high, the worse and better health status of a patient. And you can see that a heart failure patient gets an insult or a exacerbation as it is called, and this exacerbation makes that the patient goes down the drain a little bit more. And after a second exacerbation, you see that the steepness of the line is increased. And after the third exacerbation, you will get into what we call a line of hospitalizations where you get also some medicine to release, to um, define or mitigate the symptoms you have. They usually do this with diuretics, ACE inhibitors, or beta blockers. However, these patients can build up some intolerance and then the um, therapy is not effective and they have another exacerbation. And then you end up in time with inotropes. And I get back to the inotropes a little bit later, but inotropes are basically sympathetic enhancers where they increase the function of the heart. But in theory, it has proven that although it gives a short-term relief, in the end, people die earlier than not given inotropes. So again, overall 50% of the heart failure patients do not survive beyond the five years, and 40% of the patients hospitalized with heart failure do not survive are or remit, are rem admitted within one year. Here we see a little bit of heart failure symptoms and therapies, and since I'm working for a device company, I am not talking too much about the, uh, the drug therapies, but uh, more about the um, device therapies. First of all, we can classify heart failure into stage A to stage D, or some, some others use the New York Heart Association class one to four. I'm talking about the Intermax a little bit later because it's more specific to the vet. 
But in general, we have this classification in four categories. And then you can see patients with stage A receive this medical treatment, but patients in stage B and C, depending on the etiology of the heart failure, can have an ICD, which is an implantable cardiac defibrillator, so for ventricular arrhythmias, or a CRT, which is a cardiac resynchronization therapy device, when there is an electrical dyssynchrony observed in these patients. So these are usually devices we planned in in patients with stage B or C or New York Heart Association class two or three. In the end, when patients come to the end of class C or progressing into class D, we will have what we see here is a VET, a ventricular assist device. Again, here on the Right side of the slide, you can see the different classifications of the symptoms of these patients had, ranging from, you know, no limitation physical activity, but surely having hemodynamic signs of a heart failure, like a ejection fraction of less than 35%, onwards to class four or stage D, where patients have symptoms at rest, and usually these symptoms are uh, um, swollen legs, uh, um, and then also dyspnea. Like, I, like we showed in the previous slide, we have the end of class C or D, the Intermax score. Sorry. So Intermax stands for, um, let's go one back, stands for Interagency Registry for Mechanically Assisted Circulatory Support. This scale helps to assign patients with advanced heart failure into seven levels according to the hemodynamic profile and the level of target organ, uh, organ damage. Sorry, this goes here. They have some, some, you know, some nice terminology from advanced near class three, and then they have terminology like walking wounded, housebound, frequent flyer, stable but dependent, and this is again this enotrope uh, dependency, sliding fast, meaning there's not much time left, and in this the final we have the crash and burn where there's a critical cardiogenic stroke. And um, they, I think the, the rate, the, the percentage of dying here is over 80%. Again, this was put into place for the, um, yeah, the timing for an LVET, which stands for left ventricular assist device referral. So, go to the next slide. You can see here a little bit of the um, and you can take a look at this by yourself about the different therapies we're going to give when these patients go from intermix, from near class one to stage four. And in the end, of course, we have these palliative care. And stage D, like I alluded to before, has up to 80% mortality in a year. So what do we do with these patients, right? I told you before, we're going to talk about inotropes. Inotropes are an imperfect solution. So we've done studies before and say, okay, let's give these people some inotropic therapy, and usually this contains this right, um, sympathetic drugs like dubitamin, which increase cardiac contractility. But this increase in contact, cardiac contractility comes at a cost, and it has been proven that the efficiency of the heart, so meaning the pump function it has, divided by the oxygen it consumes comes into an inefficient, inefficient range, which then leads to a quicker death than not giving the um, inotropic therapies. So here we see that, you know, what are we going to do with this patient? So we have not a very good therapy at hand, and these patients usually are uh, eligible for a heart transplant. So when we look at the ESC guidelines for or the heart failure guidelines and recommendations for vet therapy, we see that the remaining or the golden standard remains um, a heart transplantation. But in these numbers here, where I put in some numbers, you know, about 1,900 heart transplants in Western Europe in 2016, and these are the different countries where the heart transplants are being done. So. The availability of the heart transplant is far, far less than the patients we are currently, uh, uh, you know, in what we are currently having. This means that other therapies need to be 
um, implemented. And therefore, the need for a left ventricular assist device or a right ventricular assist device, because we can have left ventricular failure, but also right ventricular failure, or both, was initiated. And we will talk about a little bit about the progression. But, you know, this is why it became apparent. No heart transplants available. What do we do with these patients? And this is depicted in the next slide. So the indications for VET therapy are, uh, we can divide in threefold. First, we have the bridge to transplant. Like I told you before, we had some, pay, the, 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 the golden standard is a transplant. And these patients who receive a transplant do exceptionally well. So it's, it's a perfect therapy for these patients. But so we need to make sure that there is some kind of a support while the patients are waiting a transplant. Of course, not all of them who get a, a left ventricular assist device will get to the transplant, but this is what we call bridge to transplant. And it's coming with a class 1B recommendation from the American Heart Association and a class 2AC recommendation from the European Society for Cardiology. The second um, therapy we can use, or we use the LVET for, or the VET for, is the destination therapy. And this is a little bit borne out of the fact that, you know, there are not heart transplants available. So it appears that in some cases, over many cases, we can put the particular assist device in, but where a subsequent transplantation is not planned. For instance, there are exclusion criteria for patients not receiving a transplant. So maybe because one transplant was already tried, but it was not successful, People have too much comorbidity, so the likelihood of them dying is very great. And then you are, you know, not eligible anymore. So this is the destination therapy is support for those whom subsequent transplant is not planned. And this destination therapy is not available in all countries yet. So in the Netherlands, for instance, it is available in certain uh, hospitals. Uh, they can implant a VET device for destination therapy. Then there is also what we call a bridge to recovery. So this will give support for a few days, weeks, but in essence, in essence, is a temporary support. And to give you an example, some patients, uh, and in this, in this case, of course, female patients, will present with postmortem cardiomyopathy, and these patients are not eligible for a heart transplant, so they need to be rescued that the heart can recover from the, the birth of the child and then the LVET or VET system can be explanted. So these are the indications for VET therapy with the destination therapy being in the children's shoes and the bridge to recovery in a smaller uh, size of patients. You could also um, imagine, and that has been shown in, in, in some cases, where the destination therapy or the bridge to transplant therapy is so successful in remodeling of the patient's heart that this might um, preclude these patients from needing a transplant. And then in these cases, also the uh, fat can be explanted. So we talked about the patients who are eligible for um, a fat device, but like all device uh, therapies, Patient selection is utmost important. I'm not going to talk too much about the following two to three slides, but this is just an indication of the need where you can see that the medium survival decreases after each heart failure um, related hospitalization. I showed you the curve with the exacerbations. Here are just the numbers how you can, you know, decrease your, <coughs> um, your survival rate with the subsequent hospitalizations. This is the curve which I want to, to put more emphasis on because this shows you actually, you know, when do we need to implant the VET system? It's the same for all the other devices. If the patients are too well, it's a very expensive therapy to put in with associated risk. If we put it in patients which are too sick, then it might be perceived that the therapy we give is not very efficient. And that's not because of the therapy in itself, maybe, but because that the therapy was applied in patients who are too sick. So we put here a 
you know, functional class, and this is again the Intermax scores from one to seven, where the current belief is where we should be implanting um, the VET system. Again, this is open for discussion, but I just want you to think about it that it's not as easy cut as it is said. So it's always good for a company to put the devices in early, but we also need to make sure that we have an economic benefit for these patients. So this is something we need to consider. So this is another slide depicting the same thing, the time to consider the vet therapy. And some patient, some papers have said, you know, instead of the Intermax core, you can use another kind of, you know, modality, and which is here called time. So the two readmissions within the past year, the inner trope is considered, but not being uh, implemented because of too many side effects. The medical therapy is optimized. We can have a whole discussion about medical therapy. I don't want to go into that, but we always try medicines first because the device is way too invasive, and then the ejection fraction below the 35%. Again, these are examples just to make you think that it is very important to define the patient population for your therapy very carefully. Now we go to the VET and its components. So since I'm a Medtronic employee, you will see more Medtronic components, but in essence, the components for the different companies are pretty much similar. So here, we, I show you the main components, and then I'm gonna show you a movie and, but the main components are the LVAT pump depicted by one, then the batteries depicted by two, the drive line here with three, the controller by four. So that, I'm going to put some more details in the different components, but these are, in fact, the most important components. So I'm going to now move to the YouTube movie. Takes a bit of a time. Bear with me. Okay, I'm gonna stop it and a little while because I need to get the volume up. Adverse events and instructions prior to using this device. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hold the video, put them on pause a couple of times to give a little bit more explanation. It might be that the sound of the video itself is really difficult for you to hear. My voice should be clear, but please take a look at the uh, uh, video by yourself and then use the sound. The hardware ventricular assist system is a miniaturized implantable circulatory support system for the treatment of advanced heart failure. The hardware system consists of a small continuous flow pump with integrated inflow cannula so again, what they said here was a continuous flow pump. So we get back to that later, but that means that it's a constant flow. So normally the heart has a volatile flow. These devices provide a constant flow. The reason why we took a constant flow is that the device can be made much more miniature than with a volatile flow. And I come back in the end when we're gonna discuss the possible uh, improvements in the LVET system. Outflow graph with strain release, a drive line, an external controller, and external power sources. At the core of the hardware platform is a proprietary suspension system for the wide-bladed impeller. Using a combination of both hydrodynamic and passive magnetic forces, a thin layer of blood is established between the impeller and the pump housing. During operation, there are no... Okay, there was a little bit of mistake. We're going to continue. ...for the wide-bladed impeller. Using a combination of both hydrodynamic and passive magnetic forces, a thin layer of blood is established between the impeller and the pump housing. During operation, 
there are no points of mechanical contact within the pump, effectively creating a wearless system. The HVAD pump, roughly the size of a golf ball, is capable of providing up to 10 liters per minute of blood flow. Its small size and integrated inflow cannula allow the device to be implanted completely in the pericardial space directly adjacent to the heart, thereby avoiding abdominal surgery. The implant procedure makes use of a proprietary sewing ring and custom apical coring tool, which allow the pump to be attached to the apex of the left ventricle. The outflow graph is then attached to the ascending aorta. So I want to draw your attention to this a little bit deeper. So you see that we have an inlet of the vet, and then we go through a tube to the outlet, which is in the ascending aorta. So this makes the pump preload dependent, meaning the more preload there is, the more blood can be pumped away. But on the other, other end, it makes it afterload sensitive, meaning if the blood pressure is high in the aorta, there is more resistance. We come to back to this also a little bit later. In place, blood flows from the left ventricle through the inflow cannula into the impeller. It then exits through the outflow graft to circulate throughout the body. The driveline cable, constructed with fatigue-resistant conductor wires, similar to those used in pacemakers, exits the patient's skin and connects the implanted pump to an externally worn controller. The controller is powered by two lithium-ion batteries, or one battery plus an adapter connecting to a wall or vehicle electricity outlet. The controller operates the pump and features a two-line LCD screen to display parameters, alarms, and recommended troubleshooting concerning the operation of the system. The controller and batteries are carried in a case designed to be worn either around the waist or over the shoulder. Good. Then let's get back to the presentation. Again, the, the link is depicted here below. So, it contains a lot of components, and normally, you know, when Medtronic originally started, it has these implantable devices. This is now a device which has a lot of um, devices outside of the bodies. And you can understand that the pump is consuming a lot of energy, and that's why we have these two batteries. So the two batteries are also there just as a backup. If one fails, you need to have a backup because if the pump is not functioning, it might be that the uh, patient dies. Here are a little bit of uh, more detailed pictures. So we see the wide blade impeller, both magnetically and hydrodynamically suspended. So it means that there is no friction movement, a very um, limited um, chances of getting the blood being destroyed by friction. Usually it's about 160 grams with a 50 cc of content. It looks rather small, but it's, we can still improve on making it smaller. And then we have dual motors designed to deliver power efficient and, and, and redundant, that there is absolutely no problem with the patient's uh, safety. Again, a little bit more in detail about the pump design. We have the blood here and the impeller and the pumping housing. You will see that still there's a very thin layer of blood and it will be moved in one direction. The range of flow we can do with the HVAT and the other uh, fats is between, 10, between 2 and 10 liters per minute. And this is to meet the patient's need. Like I indicated before, this will be a continuous or uh, flow, another pulsatile flow. And the physician now needs to decide when the patient is being implanted with the device at what speed the patient will go home. And the patient will go home where the patient feels good from a symptom point of view and where, you know, the, the, the device is not at a too low RPM, which is then translated into a cardiac output 
just to sustain the pump features. But it's not adaptable, meaning if the patient would walk up the stairs, the pump will not be able at this stage to increase the cardiac output to meet with the increased demand the patient has. The device can be put in the patient's chest to a stenotomy or a trochotomy. So it used to be only trochotomy, but now with the new you know, tools we have for the, from, a, from a surgical point of view, we can also do a stenotomy, which is much more or less invasive. We talked about this, it's still in progress, but what you would like to do is to damage, to reduce the damage to the blood cells. And you can do this by these pumps, and you can also do this by specific coatings of the, the, the metals inside the pump. Like I said, the FET settings are set by the VET operators to optimize left ventricular unloading to improve the patient's output. But, you know, it's only with the speed what you can do. And like I alluded before, the patient is, doesn't need to be uh, symptomatic, but it has to reduce the heart failure symptoms. Then another thing which you can keep in mind, because sometimes when patients with VAT fall down and people try to look for a pulse in these patients, it's not apparent, right? So I told you it's a continuous flow. So you will not be able to feel a pulse in these patients and you might consider these patients to be dead. So luckily they have some kind of identification that they are having a VAT device and you can see it clearly by the, the, all the tools and devices they have outside of the body, but you cannot feel a pulse. But not having a auto valve opening is also from a physiological point of view uh, um, de deleterious to some of the phys um, physiology. So preferred is that the VET settings somehow have the aortic valve opening to be still present. This is not always possible because like I said, we need to relieve the part failure symptoms. I come to that a little bit later because it would be much more physiological to have a device setting which on occasion, maybe not continuously, but on occasion, is allowing the aorta valve to open. If the aorta valve doesn't open, it can grow and um, be not able to uh, open at any time. So a little bit more at the procedure, you saw the, 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 the animation, but a little bit more pictures of how this now looks in real life. You can see here, this is like the case where all the tools are being embedded, um, sorry. And here you see the wetting of the devices, the construction of the devices. There needs to be some tailoring to the, to the patient, right? Every patient is different. So the physician needs to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the anastomosis are being correctly placed on the orta and that the drive lines are the, 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 the uh, good uh, fixated in the chest and that the strain relief is also at the right side. So there is a little bit of, of, of um, man work, hand man work um, present. So these are the different devices, again, uh, for your references. And here a little bit more into detail in the, yeah, the actually um, operation where we put the device into the apex of the heart. So you sew the ring around the myocardium using A to 10, A to 12 pledge that they call double arm sutures is depicted here. And you reinforce this with these um, felt strips. And then you need to cut you know, into the heart. So the patient is on bypass, obviously, but this is like a pretty invasive um, um, cutting down. So you create a, a incision within the ring by making a cross. And then if you deploy the head into the apex of the heart, you release the head, rotate the ring. So all the device companies have come a different tool, but it's really, really straightforward and very intuitive. Then you can remove it. Of course, there is limited blood into the, in the cavity because of the bypass. And then you need to see how you, this is a little bit a picture of you showing the remaining blood outside of the cavity. And then you make sure that you place the cannula correctly. So this is the inlet cannula. This is the vet device. This is like the line of blood which goes to the aorta. And here you see that it needs to be perpendicular to the tissue. Because if it's not placed perpendicular to the tissue, you can have what we call suction. That means that the power of the pump, the suction power of the pump is so great that it sucks up some of the cardiac tissue. Normally, it's not the cardiac tissue 
in the apical wall, but it's more the cardiac tissue on the septal wall as being depicted later. So you need to make sure that the position of the cannula is optimal. So Medtronic has what we call a, a specific readout of the HVAT. So you, you know that you can make ECGs of the heart. Um, Medtronic has an HVAT hardware, particular assist device, which can also give you a readout, which is surrogate to the ECG. And this is depicted here. So it's, in, it's a unique feature. And what you can do is seeing a pressure wavelength. So this is depicting the patient's left ventricular pressure and the aorta pressure. And this is actually translated in what they call a um, waveform for the device. So it's the flow depicted by the time. And the rate of blood flow through any continuous flow vet is dictated by the pressure gradient between the inlet and the outlet ports. What I alluded to before in the movie, you have the um, preload and you have the afterload. And then it's also connected to the rotational speed, which is the revolutions per minute of its impeller. That's the inside ring. These relations are depicted by what they call HQ curves, and these are on the right side of this graph. And re the HQ curves are represented of the HVAT device. At a given RPM, flow decreases as the pressure gradient increases. And at a given pressure gradient, flow increases as the RPMs are increased. Because most continuous flow vets are implanted with the inflow cannula in the LV apex and the outflow cannula to the ascending aorta, the instantaneous pressure difference between the LV and the aorta is the main determinant of the pressure gradient across the pump. So this in turn determines the flow, which is depicted by Q, at the instant in time for a given pump speed. So accordingly, because both LV and aortic pressures vary during the cardiac cycle, so does the pressure gradient across the pump. This time varying pressure gradient determines the characteristics of the flow waveform. During ventricular diastole, the pressure gradient between ventricle and aorta is large, and the pump flow is at its lowest values. Again, please remember that we are having a continuous flow pump, so it needs to adjust its RP, uh, uh, RPM, which is then this being determined by the power to have a continuous flow. So conversely, the pressure gradient is lowest during ventricular system and flow is at its highest value. So this might be pretty difficult to understand when I'm saying this, so please I re uh, read the um, um, the paper which is depicted on this slide. Bottom line is we can we get these HQ curves, we get these flow waveforms, and we can do some monitoring with them. So they can be used as a readout and be applied for specific applications. So this is again the pump flow versus time where the cardiac cycle is being depicted in here. And there are numerous algorithms developed whether they, they still need to be clinically validated, which you can take away from these HVAT. So please consider this as a feedback tool, tool, for instance, to detection of if a patient would be walking upstairs or if a patient is increasing its heart rate, then probably he is exercising and then the pump speed should be adjusted to the exercise by increasing. In the other way around, you know, when a patient is sleeping and the heart rate is decreased, then the flow pump should be at a lower speed because there is not much more um, uh, energy or blood flow required. Again, this is a metronic specific waveform, but you can get a whole lot of um, uh, physiological relevant properties out of it. Some food for thought. So what about the clinical outcomes? So We've shown that the best therapy would still be the heart transplant, but the LVAT, in this case is so, the left ventricular assist device, made progress through the, uh, the last years. So this is a paper of 2001, so this is the early days of the uh, HVAT uh, and LVAT uh, applications. You still see that when these patients, you know, these eligible patients, class three or class four at the end, 
they have a 8% survival after two years. This was greatly in, increased with the application of an LVET. So this was in 2001. If you go on, this is a study in 2013. And now we are looking already at above 75% of survival. And this is a bridge to transplant therapy. So these patients were in the end, most of the patients were given in heart transplant. You still can also see that um, we eventually, the drugs became better as well. <clears throat> these are the latest data. These are for 2018. And then the overall survival patients receiving HFAT, and this is through a thoracotomy, is 89% at 12 months and 87% at 24 months. So we are greatly improving the survival rate and also the quality of life and functional capacity of these patients, which is depicted here. So we are making, making great, great progress. So are we there yet? No, we are not. There are some serious steps we can take and improvements, and this might be something of interest to you. So <clears throat> there are a lot of complications still addressed to the VET systems. It's common and the prevalence is a little bit different throughout the different devices, but these are the most common uh, complications we see. On average, there are three to five adverse events in the first year after implant. Most of them have to do with the hemocompatibility. So we have a pump in here, and I told you it's very important that the blood cells will not be damaged too much. So the design of the blood of the fat can still be improved by making the actual detrimental effects of the pump on the blood cells to a minimum. So bleeding is a problem. And the bleeding especially occurs in the GI tract, so this is gastrointestinal, and in the nervous system. So we have patients uh, coming to the OR or hospital with stroke. The thromboembolic events are, of course, also related to some strokes. So not to, sorry, the, the, the stroke needs to be from the thromboembolic events. And it's most of the time it's pump thrombosis. So we are here, and it can be either pre-pump, intra-pump, or post-pump. So you see there are areas which is kind of expected where there is an increased um, chance of thrombosis and then these clots can cause um, a stroke effect. The other is the infection. We have made serious steps in decreasing the um, infection rate because of all the anti-inflammatory modalities we have at hand, but still, we still have the drive line coming outside to the body, and it's an open wound continuously. Then we have some arrhythmias. As you can imagine, the heart is not really um, giving the hemodynamics as it should be, and there is an increased chance of uh, AF. And there are some cardiovascular complications, which are RV dysfunction. It has been um, discussed that when you have a sudden change in the pumping ability of the LV, it can then have a detrimental function on the RV. So we should come up with some kind of algorithm which lets the RV in time adjust to the new situation. But this is very common, this is like 30%. And then of course we have also after insufficiency. So basically these are complications which we need to solve and to make the therapy even more accepted. So improvements, so the inflow cannula position away from the septum, I told you before, the, we need the inlet cannula in a position where it cannot be sucking in some of the myocardial tissue, and this is usually the septum, so we can improve on how to avoid suction. We talked about the fact that we need dynamic flow. We have continuous flow now, I told you, that's because we can make the devices much smaller than with the pulsatile flow in the old days, but now technology has progressed so far that we can make a dynamic flow. So we can change the um, um, output of the pump according to change in preload or in heart rate. We also need to think about the pulsatile flow. Um, we, the heart has a pulsatile flow and the, 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 the native heart has a pulsatile flow. And it seems that especially aorta leaf movement or the pulsar flow in the GI tract is the, uh, able to reduce bleeding. So there are some preliminary results showing that, you know, it's the continuous flow that causes the bleeding in the GI tract more specifically than in the central nervous system. 
And then we have the recovery. I told you it's a, it's a niche group at this moment, but maybe if we can have a good patient selection, we can put a vet device a little bit earlier in and then make sure that the patients can you know, recover. Reduce the bleeding. Um, yeah, that was another hemocompatibility um, effect. And this can also be reduced to the use of antiplatelet agent or an altering pump speed to allow pulsatile flow. And then when to implant the vet, this is more like an overarching kind of improvement. We can maybe, you know, when we know more about these, um, let's say, possible improvements, we can also tell more about when that would be the ideal time to implant in a vet system. So what's the future of the ventricular assist devices? So I told you nowadays we have uh, patients who are still very aware of their uh, device. They need to exchange batteries. They have problems with the shower. They can shower, but it's much more cumbersome. So that's a different when we talk about pacemakers, ICDs, or CAT devices, which we can call a forgettable device. So where the companies now are putting a lot of effort in is making the, pay, making the VET device implantable, a so-called uh, forgettable device. So the patient knows he has a device, but since he has no restrictions in movements, he will be, in the end, not thinking about it as a, a non-forgettable device. And in the end, you know, it's it's you. There are a large group of patients who, besides LV failure, have also RV failure. So they need a bivet, a biventricular assist device. But in the end, also this might not be the rescue for patients. And a lot of groups are working on a total artificial heart. That's a little bit futuristic in your eyes, but I know that groups already have implanted in preclinical studies these devices and they function very well. Again, I think the future is broad and exciting for uh, ventricular assist devices. I thank you for your attention. Again, questions, please email these to me and I'll make sure you get the answers. Thank you.